Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching this special telecast with me, Frank Rausen Pereira, Finance Minister, uh, addressed all the key constituencies in his interim budget speech on Friday. From farmers to the middle class, there was something in it for everyone. The Prime Minister called it an all-encompassing budget for new India. But the big question is, what does this budget do to our fiscal consolidation? How are some of these schemes going to be funded? And what does it mean for the India growth story? That's what I would like to discuss with my special guest on the program today, Krishnamurti Subramanian, Chief Economic Advisor, Government of India. Welcome and thank you for joining me on Rajya Sabha Television. Happy to be here, Frank, and uh, wish the viewers a very good evening. Absolutely. And my first question to you, of course, I'd like to start on a light note. Uh, you were appointed as CEA barely 50 days ahead of the presentation of the budget. So how was it for you in the lead up to the interim budget 2019? Let's not forget there was a change in finance minister as well during those 50 days. So it's, it's been quite revealing for me to observe how strong a democracy we have. Um, and I say this because um, the kind of institutional apparatus that we have um, for policy making where there are so many touch points um, for policy and therefore um, particular individuals you know while when they are there they can contribute um, but the process does not depend on on individuals um, and uh, remember also that the budget or in, in fact policy making itself is a mammoth team effort which is what I've uh, been able to observe from close quarters I've been privileged to, to, to see this and um, I was being asked how has been the experience of, you know, um, in, informally actually when I was chatting. Um, I, I think I've had a, a, a very, very uh, rosy view so far possibly because I've seen it when at the height of the policy making, which is, which is the budget. Um, in one word, would you call it surreal? Um, enjoyable. Okay, <laughs> enjoyable. All right. So talking about a team effort, I'd like to understand from you and like to know from you, what were your contributions in this interim budget 2019? I think it's better to look at instead, um, as I already said, it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's a team effort, by definition, um, several individuals contribute um, at different places. You know, maybe an idea comes from someone, the idea is crafted by, by, by someone else. Um, so I think it would not be uh, appropriate for, for me to, to talk about uh, my own contribution. Uh, suffice to say, it's been a fantastic team effort and I've enjoyed to be part of that team. Some economists and uh, members of the opposition and some other parties, you know, have said that convention has been broken of presenting a vote on account budget and instead you've gone ahead with, you know, a, a different kind of a budget, an interim budget is what uh, the government has called it, at a, in a crucial election year, if the opposition has called it a populist budget, your thoughts on that? So, um, the political narrative aside, um, I think we must keep in mind that there have been several precedents of um, interim budgets being presented when uh, key interventions that were the need of the hour uh, had been made. Uh, for instance, uh, when Mr. Chidambaram presented the budget in 2014, um, the, the government felt that the manufacturing sector needed some intervention and that was announced. Um, in 2008-2009, um, uh, when the financial crisis was going on and Mr. Pranam Mukherjee presented the budget, there was a, a, a case made for the fiscal targets to be relaxed uh, given the fiscal space that was necessary to be created at that point in time. Similarly, when Mr. Jaswan Singh had presented, uh, you know, the, an interim budget, he had, um, you know, uh, made the case for interventions in the sugar sector. Um, so, th there is clearly precedence for, for, for interventions being made, uh, you know, as part of interim budgets. Uh, what we must keep in mind, you know, as many of us uh, feel that, uh, that India is often constantly in an electoral cycle. Uh, and therefore, the process of governance is something that has to go on. Um, and uh, we also must keep in mind that the 
uh, that we all had elected you know this government and for that matter any government for a period of five years and not for four years 11 months uh, or, or any other shorter period and that is why these interim budgets have actually which I gave examples of have done the necessary intervention. So there's nothing out of the ordin ordinary is what you're suggesting. Yes um, and I think we must keep in mind that the in, in the, the, the finance minister, for instance, mentioned at least a couple of times, you know, about the mariada of the, you know, of the interim budget, which has been respected uh, in, in, in many ways. All right. It appears to be a please all budget. You know, the prime minister himself said it's a budget for all. The key big takeaways for you from this budget. Uh, for me, the um, key, key takeaways are that this is a budget that really focuses on the middle class, um, uh, focuses on farmers and focuses on the, on, on the poorer sections of society. Uh, what we must keep in mind here is that, um, at least in my opinion, um, the budget is a culmination, budget announcements are a culmination of the um, of, of steps that have been taken for these sections of society all through the uh, the, the four and a half years of the government uh, and I would like to take some examples. Um, let's start with the middle class. Um, you know, in, in, under this government inflation has been brought down to 2.19 percent. That was the latest number in December 2018. The average rate of inflation has been about four and a half percent. You know, uh, in 2014, the rate of inflation was 10 percent, you know, and, and, and above. So if you, if you uh, take into account, if those rates of inflation had prevailed today, then you, people like you and me would have been looking at paying 30 to 35 percent higher on essential commodities. Uh, and for a, for a, for a median uh, citizen, that is a significant part of, the, um, you know, of their household budget. Therefore, inflation has actually made a big difference to the purchasing power of the middle class. Uh, number two, if you look at, take GST. Um, and I will be coming to you know what has been done in this particular uh, you know budget, but it's important to keep, to understand the background for this. Mm. Um, take GST for instance. Um, if you take a household that spends about eight thousand five hundred per per month, let's say on. If I could just interrupt and before we actually move on to uh, you know GST on inflation, you know just 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 sure. uh, sidetracking a little bit. Sure, you know? sure, sure. You suggested that the inflation numbers have been in control and inflation is not a problem. Does that mean we can expect? a rate cut, an interest rate cut uh, uh, during the next MPC? Um, I, I, I would uh, think that the uh, Reserve Bank is taking into account all these um, you know, all these uh, aspects of the macro economy. Um, they pay very careful attention to um, you know, all the drivers of, of, of inflation and uh, it would not be appropriate for me to though comment on what they should or should not be doing because you know it is in their domain and they do a good job of assessing this. All right, GST now then. So um, as I was saying the middle class, um, middle class you know has benefited from GST because if you take a household that spends about 8,500 because of GST the benefit 8,500 8, per month the because of GST the benefit has been about 350 rupees per month. Um, the actual tax that they pay and the savings thereby. Um, a third aspect of the middle class is that you know when, when you had double digit rates of inflation the real rates of saving was in the negative you know with a, about an 8 percent rate of interest you were looking at minus 2 percent in terms of the real rate of saving. In contrast now at about 7 percent as a savings rate and in inflation below 4 percent you're looking at 3 percent real rate of rate of saving. So there's been an increase of about 5 percent in the real rate of savings um, which then puts more disposable income in the hands of the savers especially senior citizens. Um, so collectively when you look at it there's been a lot that's been done for the middle class and now that brings us to the you know what what was announced in today's budget. Um, in particular the relaxation of the you know of, of uh, for the for the taxpayers. Before um, we get to the taxes since yes. we are a GST I mean I don't want to revisit it later since yeah. we are a GST. I, I actually was trying to talk, talk about the middle class. Please um, go ahead. And, Sorry. Um, so the, because this is really uh, focused on the middle class. Um, so a, a, you know a, a taxpayer 
who has a taxable income of of 5 lakhs um, would be benefiting. Now, I note that I mentioned taxable income, which means that if you include uh, some of the savings, some of the other um, you know, exemptions that can be employed, then you are looking at uh, a, a taxpayer with an income of about anywhere between 8.5 to 9 lakhs also not having to pay any, any uh, you know, tax, which is a big benefit for the middle class. So, that is the so to, all in all, if you take, you know, the middle class has benefited significantly from this budget and from what are steps that have been taken in the in, in the past. Number two, as I had mentioned, you know, farmers. Um, the th this government, you know, today announced the income support of 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 six thousand rupees, uh, you know, to uh, for for small and marginal farmers, which is important because you know over time, because of you know of a father passing on land to actually to to many sons, the land holdings have become quite fragmented. As a result, the proportion of farmers that have land holdings less than two hectares is significant. Um, and and that is something that you know this income support does uh, you know uh, provide for uh, what we must keep in mind is that this un income support is above and beyond you know any of the other schemes that are already there for instance the minimum support uh, you know price msp scheme which is there for 23 crops uh, which provides 1.5 times the cost of production and therefore the farmer gets 50% of his cost of production as is as is benefit and it was expanded to 23 crops um, this brings in not only your you know your your um, those who have land holdings, but others who actually till it as well, um, and to, uh, and there are also other schemes. Your you know in interest subvention, the uh, you know the, the input subsidies on fertilizer, you know electricity, etc. Collectively, when you you know combine all of them, there is actually also benefit for the farmers, which is important because you know you, we have an economy where the food. Production is growing at about uh, at about three percent in plus, and the population is growing at less than one percent. Therefore, you will inevitably have surpluses, which will bring down prices. Therefore, this intervention was something that was quite required. Um, <clears throat> Food production is indeed going up, but infrastructure really rural infrastructure could be an issue, isn't it? I mean, because that's an area that we need to concentrate on as well. Because if you look at a small country like Holland, with about twenty thousand farmers is the biggest agricultural exporter in the world. So, there is tremendous potential there for India. Um, I think what we must keep in mind here is that the the land holdings um, make a big difference in terms of actual productivity of agricultural productivity of land. Because uh, investments in you know in technology, investments in you know in enhancing productivity have a fixed cost and that fixed cost is is a lot more feasible to bear when the la size of your land holding is much bigger when you are looking at a farmer that has let's say less than you know 1 hectare of of land then these fixed costs in enhancing productivity do not become feasible and therefore pooling land you know and and these farmer produ uh, production organizations fpos as we know um, would be would be ways to actually you know sort of alleviate some of the problems from fragmented land holdings uh, it's a good benchmark to have for what you know, countries like Holland, New Zealand, etc., have done. But it is also important to keep in mind that they are working from land holdings that are much, much larger, and which make these investments uh, you know feasible. Um, one, one other aspect I think which is important to keep in mind, especially in the context of the question that you've asked, is that um, as I uh, you know already had mentioned, the problem is not as much on the production side. The problem with you know with with agriculture is on the marketing side. Um, the the fact that you have, uh, for instance, farmers that grow perishables um, oftentimes get anywhere between 15 to 25 percent of the retail price, and that's because of the way in which the you know it produ proceeds through the ch value chain, and then there are lots of intermediaries. Here's where a solution like Enam um, is 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 very critical. You know, uh, recently we actually saw that interstate state, state trade has happened on Enam, which is actually a big step. Um, um, for instance, you know, tomato. Tomatoes, tomatoes were sold from uh, from uh, Bareilly in in Uttar Pradesh to Bhivandi in in Uttarakhand. Uh, similarly, you had groundnuts being sold from um, you know from from uh, Telangana to Andhra Pradesh. Um, these are ways of trying to bring the market to the farmer um, because right now we have many frag fragmented markets and 
integrating them through solutions like enam and other technological solutions will be also another critical way to address this this issue of marketing of the agricultural produce talking about agriculture you know several steps have been taken by the government over the last four and a half years pm kisan of course on expected lines is a big ticket scheme really but farmer distress or agri distress continues what is the crux of the problem and is something like pm kisan enough to address the woes of the farmers i i think i've already um, you know uh, alluded to this i mentioned about how when you have uh, production growing at in excess of 3% with a population less than 1% you will have uh, you know ex surplus building up and when you have surplus prices will 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 decrease and therefore the the um, what has been done as part of pm kisan is very important because what is being done here is this is not a case for instance there was debate about about loan waivers um, you know i have done some research um, recent Uh, an article of mine on this got published in the journal of law and economics um on the loan waiver that was done by upa and what we found there was that it's the it's the it's the it's a non -deser not so deserving farmer that you know ends up cornering a significant part of the benefits from the loan waiver as it is a loan waiver can only be provided to a farmer that has a loan from the formal you know formal financial system which tend to be a larger farmers um the uh, lo loan waiver actually induces moral hazard which we observed actually in the data uh, compared to that here you have an instance of an income support um and which can also be used for 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 production for in you know in inputting into production um and it also provides the farmer the ability to judge where he wants to use that that income um so this is a much better way of intervening um and it i think what we must also keep in mind is that it continues this this government's focus on using income transfer especially through the dbt route for instance uh, 6 lakh crores of uh, you know dbt transfers have been made over the last you know du during during the last 5 years and that has led to savings of of 1 lakh crore so um, compared to other other mechanisms this would be a a better way because it will reach the income the the hands of the small and marginal farmers directly and and therefore will enable them to to assess how to use that income a final point that is important to keep in mind is that especially for farmers and the poor you know So any any shock that they get, you know, whether it's for, for instance, let's say a pest that you know attacks them, um, it, it even small incomes that actually that is assured can make a big difference to them because it creates that insurance. Which you know, while we have other mechanisms, but this is something that adds to that and reduces their risk significantly. Talking about PM Kisan, you know, one big question is of course, how are you going to fund a scheme like PM Kisan and other such schemes? Because let's not forget the allocation. for next year is 75000 crore rupees and if you multiply that by another 5 years it's right. a mammoth figure right. let's not forget 20000 for this year as well Correct. so where is the funding going to come from so if we look at and you know we basically need to get into the fiscal math um i think you know, what is important to keep in mind is that the uh, fiscal deficit um which was budgeted at at 3.3% for this year and has been you know as the finance minister mentioned 3.4% i think what we have to remember there is actually a 0.02% change hmm. because the actual number that was budgeted was 3.34 and you know it it what has been announced is 3.36 which has been rounded off to 3.4 as it is as as is the practice so actual change is only 2% despite accounting for the 20000 crores that is required in this particular year going forward the 75000 crores has been already budgeted for in the you know in the in the uh, budget for for next year uh, and and you know given that we actually are looking at the fiscal deficit figure of 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 3.4% what i think is important to keep in mind is that you know these have been these projections have been done on the gdp figures that were available till day before yesterday yesterday the nso has released you know gdp figures which are actually now you know we're sort of understanding um, but what is is critical to 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 look at there is that the 
fiscal so that the GDP growth for you know FY17 and FY18 have been revised significantly upwards. If we you know if we project the GDP based on those growth rates, we are looking at a GDP of 225 lakh crore. So the denominator increases significantly, and you are then looking at a fiscal deficit figure for next year for three point about 3.1 percent, hmm. which is you know very much in the in the zone of comfort, um, and and. Also, what is important to keep in mind is that the projections that have been made are quite realistic. For instance, you know, uh, take GST collections. Um, the, the what was estimated was six lakh three crores, um, while while uh, the actual number that has been taken is one lakh crore less. So even when I've been observing from the outside, you know, the fiscal math that you know that I've seen over the last you know for for four years and this year as well has generally been quite transparent. Um, the uh, the path the glide path for achieving what the targets that FRBM act has set out has been you know has been uh, followed um Remember that glide path is not necessarily a linear one. Right. It just you need to glide into that particular uh, target. So, uh, as as because these projections have been made realistically, I uh, you know I actually uh, am, am you know quite convinced that the that the that what is required for these uh, you know for, for for the PM Kisan has been provided for in the you know in the in the next year. And as the, um, the the finance minister said, if additional were required, he you know they, it would be provided for. Where once you actually have the um, revenue buoyancy picking up further the um, you know it, it wouldn't be a problem because remember also the tax base has increased significantly from about you know 3.3 crore to 6 crore um, and that process is continuing the direct tax collections actually have been very good and once gst stabilizes i think the revenues to be able to provide for this would be there a final point which is that by putting income disposable income in the bottom of the pyramid and the middle class uh, that also you know generates consumption and thereby GDP growth, which also can provide for some of the uh, you know, outlays that are required here. So talking about fiscal consolidation and fiscal deficit, are you comfortable with 3.4%? As I already said, um, it, the, the 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 change is only a 0.02 percent, mm. and that too, if you you know, uh, if you take into account the, the the revised GDP estimates, this number actually will settle at uh, you know at three percent or less. So let's talk about uh, you know one sector and what I believe was really you know the big takeaway from this budget, the unorganized yes. sector. Now this yes. is a sector. I'm glad you bring it up. Yeah, this is a sector that has been neglected over the years. And finally, something has been done for this sector. Yeah, um, I, I think what you know you have you have brought up is extremely important because of the nature of employment that we have in, in India. Um, a large proportion of the workforce is in the unorganized sector. Uh, so when when you know we we debate about unemployment figures being you know. A, a percentage point here or there i actually feel that we oftentimes end up missing the point there because the real you know issue of debate is the is is you know meaningful employment um, and the fact that there's a lot of uh, you know the workforce that is in the unorganized sector and here's where what is important for us to recognize is that somebody who works in the uh, you know in the unorganized sector uh, once that person starts reaching old age it becomes difficult for that person to continue working and that is when that that person is is very vulnerable um, and and I, I guess that's where this pension scheme that has been announced is something that is very very welcome um, in general you know I, I, I have I think it, economists we all economists believe that the um, that, that, that the taxpayers money should be spent well on on providing for the vulnerable sections of society and here's one instance where that is being done since we are here what is the contribution really of the unorganized sector and the informal sector to the Indian economy and what does it mean for India's growth story? So I, the, the, the estimates vary. Um, you know, but but anywhere between you know two thirds to three quarters of the workforce is in the unorganized, uh, you know, unorganized sector. Um, um, with with increasing formalization through both your GST and demonetization, um, and also through the creation of startups. What you, what we have to remember very well is that something which I you know keep keep mentioning that um, if if we 
uh, observed the, the, the culture that prevailed among the youth for jobs about 10 years back, the typical youth would want to uh, you know, get a government job, would try for the lottery of a government job up until 28. Um, and if he didn't get it, and then he would s start retooling himself, retraining for maybe working in the private sector, maybe starting something on his own. What has changed now is that, especially among the middle class, that you know, people want to start their own firms and thereby create jobs. So um, given that we have the second largest uh, ecosystem for startups in the in 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 uh, you know in in the world um, this is something that will create a lot of jobs and thereby bring jobs into the you know formal sector as well for instance take something as tangible as seeing people who bring swiggy or you know uh, 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 you know your delivery or zomato or ola any of these these are people that would possibly have worked in the you know unorganized sector but for those startups that have been created and now those startups that actually have brought these sections of population into the formal sector. So going forward because of startups, because of the formalization that is being brought through a, a bigger, more important, more intensive digital economy um, and uh, the, the, the uh, steps that have been taken to, to, to formalize the, 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 the you know, bring, bring more formal uh, you know, sectors into the economy, I think employment into the formal sector will increase going forward. You know, uh Markets seem to have given this interim budget a thumbs up. Uh, Sensex has, uh, you know, uh, closed 212 points higher than uh, yesterday, of course. So what does it mean, really? Uh, is, it, uh, is it a big green signal from the markets? The way I uh, view it, and you know, this is coming from a professor who, who used to teach finance. Um, so stock, stock markets um, factor in the present value of, of future um, you know, earnings that, that come. Um, as I've already mentioned that um, a lot of the steps that have been taken put disposable income in large sections of the population who will then use that to consume more. 60% of our GDP actually, you know, uh, the, the growth comes from consumption. So an increase in the disposable income and thereby greater consumption will increase GDP growth. And those particular firms, if in fact, I was just observing some of those companies that actually, you know, uh, 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 whose, whose business model depends on consumption those stock, stocks have done you know much better and that is just reflecting the fact that there is greater disposable income that is being put so overall gdp growth and consumption will actually lead to better prospects for firms and which is being reflected in the stock price in the in the stock market in fact at a point in time the market was up about 500 points yeah. um, and there's i think some bit of at uh, around 1 pm it was yes. yeah up 500 points yes uh, and i think one other point uh, i had just checked um, even the the yields had gone up only by about nine basis points. Mm. Um, so that's re relating to what we've talked about on the fiscal prudence and the fiscal math. Right. So how will the budget be viewed by global investors and global agencies like the World Bank, IMF and Moody's and others? Um, I think it is uh, important for us to, to, to keep in mind that as I mentioned earlier, that this budget is a culmination of what has been done over the last, you know, five years. Um, what is really important for our foreign investors and domestic investors to keep in mind is that um, the, the, the checks and balances, institutional checks and balances that ensures that the, that, the, that the benefits from growth do not just accrue to a small section of that population, which is what we had earlier. Those checks and balances have been created now, the, the governance plumbing, if you, if, if, if you will. Uh, for instance, take the, uh, take the, the bankruptcy code. Uh, you know, three lakh crore of, uh, you know, of, of, of loans have now been retrieved through the bankruptcy code. Uh, the enactment of the bankruptcy code ensures that that promoters who had been playing a game of heads I win, tails you lose, um, you know, with the banks, that is something that is actually a thing of the past. That's an important governance, uh, you know, re reform. Um, we've had the reason inflation has come down so significantly is because of the monetary policy framework that's been created. And the central bank has been given a specific mandate to target inflation. Um, and, and, you know, you also have had GST, which is an important reform of creating a one India uh, in terms of, at, you know, on the tax front. Um, Together with that, the use of auction, um, you know, auction mechanisms for several, uh, you know, government uh, processes and streamlining of processes that has been done. What has therefore been achieved over the last five years is that the governance plumbing that is required to ensure that growth is equitable 
and also the benefits of growth do not get cornered by a few that has been created so you know i know for for a fact that you know as as somebody who teaches finance that you know investors look at governance very very carefully um, whether it's the governance of a particular company or the governance of a country and therefore this is an important message that our investors should be looking at that the governance plumbing has been created um, and the fiscal math as we've already talked about is something that is actually quite good so overall i i foresee the investors looking at all these collectively and what it means for you know in fact in some sense the the framework for 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 growth that to be created in the next 10 years has been created which was also outlined through the vision that the finance minister talked about for the next 10 years the 10 dimensions that he talked about and then he also mentioned which i actually i think it's it's quite credible given the performance that the government has already shown that there has been the foundation for a beautiful uh, you know uh, building has been created and, uh, and 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 that is i think the key takeaway that that investors both foreign and domestics must definitely keep in mind and before we wind up this uh, telecast you know, and, and, and conclude this interview. I must ask you about India's growth story. Of course, uh, some estimates uh, put it at 7.2 percent, the IMF says 7.5 percent. Are we well on course to achieve those estimates? I, I think, you know, if we go by the estimates that have been put out yesterday, right, um, the average growth rate over the last five years, which has been 7.3 percent on you know, older estimates, um, is, you know, will, will work out to 7.6 percent. And going forward as well, um, you know, the expectation is for, for growth of, of uh, nominal growth to be between 11.5 to, to 12 percent. And uh, there is no reason to believe that inflation would be very high given, you know, food prices, you know, what, you know, what they are and crude oil prices we don't expect to for them to go up significantly then we are looking at a real gdp growth of about seven hundred seven and a half to eight percent so the the prospects actually look good particularly given the measures that have been taken to actually build capacity at the bottom of the pyramid and you know i asked this question to several economists and several experts on on my programs i'd like to ask you the same double digit growth doable possible Yes, definitely, especially given some of the structural reforms that I talked about. Um, I think those structural reforms will ensure that we actually don't have, you know, sort of um, uh, sp speed breakers in between um, so that we, we basically grow, you know, get ahead, get to, to ahead and then the, you know, so, sort of the speed breakers have to be brought in. Uh, I think this process of creating that, um, you know, those, those structural reforms must continue for us to, uh, especially on some of the other factor markets you know you're on, on land labor etc some of those need to be done in which case we should it should be possible for us to hit you know double digit growth uh, consistently and uh, now that the budget is done and dusted one final question before i let you go what next for krishnamurti subramanian um, for me, I would um, be working on the economic survey that would be coming out in, in July. Um, as this was an interim budget, there was no economic survey. Um, that's something that I would be working on. And there are a, a few things I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, co interacting with, uh, with various people in the government. I would want to contribute to some of the key, uh, you know, aspects of uh, policy, uh, thinking about and bringing, bringing change. All right. Uh, Krishnamurti Subramanian, a pleasure interacting with you and thank you for joining us on Rajya Sabha television and putting things into perspective for us and explaining your side of the story as far as the interim budget 2019 is concerned. My pleasure. All right, that's, that's it on this interview. But as I leave, we'll leave you with some reactions from the interim budget 2019. Take a listen in and we'll be back at 9 p.m. with a new set of guests to talk about the budget and our coverage will continue. Stay tuned. हमारे साथ केंद्रीय स्वास्थ्य मंत्री अश्विनी कुमार चौबे जी हैं सर बजट पेश हो चुका है किस नजरिए से आप देखते हैं देखो ये बजट ऐतिहासिक बजट है देश में पहली बार मुझे लगता है कि इस बजट को आने के बाद लगता है देश आगे बढ़ रहा है एक प्रगतिशील देश का जो लक्षण हो सकता है हमने समाज के सभी वर्गों को सभी जाति पंथ सब प्रकार के व्यवसायिक चाहे वो किसान हो मजदूर हो गरीब हो मध्यम वर्गीय हो अमीर हो हमने हर लोगों के लिए जो वयस्क हैं जो अति वयस्क हैं उन सब लोगों के लिए हमने एक अच्छा बजट पेश किया है जो हमारी सरकार हमारे वित्त मंत्री ने जो बजट पेश किया है वो साधुवाद है और इसमें कहीं दो मत नहीं कि देश सबको साथ सबका विकास 
ये विकास की ओर प्रगति की ओर देश बढ़ रहा है और हम निश्चित रूप से नरेंद्र भाई मोदी के नेतृत्व में जो आयुष्मान भारत दो का भारत कैसा होगा अगला भारत जो 2030 उसका नीव डालने का काम किया है और इमारत बनाना अभी बाकी है सर किसानों के लिहाज से कैसे देखते हैं बजट को भाई किसान मैं किसान का बेटा हूँ अब इससे बड़ी बात क्या हो सकता है हमारे किसानों में जो किसानी था आज किसानों का खुशहाल दिन हो गया पहली बार किसानों को खुशहाली आपस हुआ है दोगुनी आय होगी हमारे साथ डेढ़ गुना हमें कीमत मिलने लगा मिडिल क्लास के लिए भी राहत दी है में पाँच लाख रुपये इनकम टैक्स हमारे रिवेट हो गए अब क्या चाहिए जो असंगठित मजदूर है हिंदुस्तान में उसको किसी ने नहीं देखा था हमने असंगठित मजदूरों को देखा और उनके बीमा उनकी योजना ऐसे तमाम योजनाएं जो लाई गई है वो निश्चित रूप में राष्ट्र हित के लिए है और देश के लिए एक बड़ा ही सुनहला अवसर है आइए हम और आप मिल करके इस देश को आगे बढ़ाएं तो मंत्री जी का मानना है कि जो बजट पेश हुआ है ये पूरी तरह से संपूर्णता का बजट है और ऐतिहासिक बजट है कैमरामैन डीके पांडे के साथ मोहम्मद फातेहटीपू राज्यसभा टीवी दिल्ली